from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon. Welcome to the Library of Congress. I'm John Cole. I'm the director of the Center for the Book, which is the reading and literacy promotion arm of the library. And I'm very pleased that you can join us today for a Center for the Book, Books and Beyond talk, and help us together uh, think about a topic that really hasn't been discussed much in the 18-year history of our Books and Beyond talks. Uh, the topic, of course, is the debate over guns in America. But aha, there really is a connection because this is going to be a historical talk that gives us a context that will be a historical context that will be familiar to a lot of the people who've been to these talks in the past. And the context is uh, the Second Amendment and of course what in the world is the Second Amendment really all about? And that's going to be our discussion and it's going to be the lively um, part of, I think, the historical argument that uh, Michael Waldman is going to give us. He really has written a very lively book about the most controversial, volatile, and misunderstood provision of the Bill of Rights. Uh, the Center for the Book, I was explaining to Michael before we started, uh, was created uh, by another lawyer whose name was Daniel Borston, who was Librarian of the Congress. 1975 to 1987, and Dan deliberately created the center to reach out to the American public uh, to stimulate public interest in books, reading, literacy, and libraries. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Borston was a lawyer before he became a historian, and let alone before he became a librarian. His first book, The Mysterious Science of the Law, was published by the Harvard University Press in 1942. And wouldn't you know it, the mysterious relationship of the law to the society within which it, we exist now is a major theme of Michael Waldman's well-received book that he's going to tell us about. I wanted to say one word about a, another activity in which the Center for the Book is deeply involved, which is the National Book Festival. Uh, we have been uh, fortunate enough to uh, be working very closely with the Library of Congress in the author programming of the National Book Festival. It was brought to the Library of Congress in 2001 by First Lady uh, Laura Bush, and she had previously created the Texas Book Festival. The Center for the Book has uh, stimulated the creation of a network of state centers. Each state now has a center and while we can't pay for them, we can help them raise money and find a home for a place in the state that stimulates public interest in reading and writers. Many of the state centers uh, work very closely with the writers of the states and develop things like literary maps and do programming and give book awards and are also involved in state book festivals. And that's how Mrs. Bush uh, was involved as First Lady of Texas. She created the Texas Book Festival for the benefit of the public libraries of Texas. And when her husband was elected president uh, in 2000, she announced to the world and to the Library of Congress that she wanted to go national with this idea and that she wanted the Library of Congress to be the partner. And we have been uh, subsequently the very proud partner for a number of book festivals which have been held on the mall. This year is different. Uh, this year we will be having the first National Book Festival in the Washington Convention Center. And it will be on August the 30th, which I know, we know, is Labor Day Saturday. Uh, the reason is that the National Park Service is setting up new sets of rules for the use of the mall and the size and the complexity of the book festival uh, at this time really has forced us to make another choice. But we're looking forward to another wonderful National Book Festival and I want to 
assure each of you that if you have come in the past, you will have a wonderful time again. We are air conditioned, of course. We go to the evenings this time. We can have graphic arts and screens and a poetry slam and more efforts, really, with graphic novels that we've been able to have. So I do hope that uh, we, you will join us, uh, if possible, on August 30th. Uh, this talk, this Books and Beyond talk, is something the Library of Congress Center for the Book has sponsored, uh, as I hinted, uh, for 18 years. Uh, all of the talks are filmed for the library's website, and nearly 300 of them are available on the website. Thus, I ask you and invite you to please turn off all things electronic. Uh, we, the format will be a presentation by our author, a brief uh, chance at questions and answers, and then a book signing, which we need to start at around 1 o'clock. And the books are for sale at the Special Library of Congress Center for the Book discount, a little bit of a discount, uh, and the author is available to sign them. Michael Waldman is a graduate of Columbia College and the New York University School of Law. He was director of speech writing for President Bill Clinton, speaking of presidents, from 1995 to 1999. And he is the author of, among other books, My Fellow Americans, The Most Important Speeches of America's Presidents from George Washington to Barack Obama. A second book, A Return to Common Sense, Seven Bold Ways to Revitalize Democracy, and also published as is the Second Amendment, a biography by Simon and Schuster, uh, is another second book, POTUS Speaks, Finding the Words that Define the Clinton Presidency. Uh, Michael now serves as the president of the Brennan Center for Justice at the New York University School of Law, a nonpartisan law and policy institute that focuses on improving the systems of democracy and justice. Uh, his new book has made quite a splash, and we're lucky to have him here. It is my pleasure to present Michael Waldman. Michael. Okay, thank, you. thank you. Thank you so very much for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I, I appreciate it very much, and you're, it, it is true that I was President Clinton's chief speechwriter, uh, and I like that introduction. Uh, he, he once introduced me as the person who typed his speeches, so I, I, like, I appreciate those kind words a bit more. Uh, it is a great thrill to be with all of you. Uh, it is a thrill to be here at the Library of Congress in the building named after James Madison uh, to talk about the structure of our Constitution and Bill of Rights, which of course also draws so much from James Madison in a sense was a building he helped build uh, or at least what, for which he was the architect. It's also a wonderful thing to be able to be part of the Center for the Book's ongoing education of all of us throughout our whole lives about the Constitution, about America, about the ideals that we seek to live out and the way those ideas and ideals, laws and uh, concepts rub up against and sometimes collide with the real world in which we all live. Um, in writing this book, which I started actually after Newtown, so uh, in the intense period when we were once again debating gun control and gun laws for the first time in a long time, I wanted to understand above all else, how does legal change happen in America? How does constitutional change really happen? Now, the Second Amendment, uh, at the time of those debates last year, was front and center at the tip of everybody's tongue. People proclaimed themselves strong supporters of the Second Amendment. Uh, discussions of uh, legislation always revolved around the question of whether uh, this right was trampled on or not. The Second Amendment, as you probably know or perhaps know, is short. It's 27 words. It's, I believe, the shortest sentence in the Constitution. In its entirety, it says, uh, a well-regulated militia, comma, being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, comma, shall not be infringed. And in the marvelous 
online, uh, online exhibits of the Library of Congress, you can see not only drafts, not a, a whole host of the background documents that led to this and the other amendments to the Constitution and for, on which I relied in working on this book. But what people don't realize, what even aficionados are surprised to learn, is that the Supreme Court never ruled that this somewhat convoluted sentence recognized an individual right to gun ownership until 2008. That was the first time. And in fact, it had ruled otherwise several times before that. So how does legal change happen? How did that happen? Justice Antony Scalia, in writing that case that was uh, known as District of Columbia versus Heller, uh, he, he very proudly said that he was using the judicial approach of originalism. He said that the, he told a journalist that this was the vindication of originalism, of the idea as he has uh, argued for and advanced that the only legitimate way to understand a constitutional provision is to ask what it meant at the time to the framers or their generation. Uh, so I thought it was important to understand, first of all, what the Second Amendment meant at the time, what it, uh, why they wrote it, how it was added to the Constitution, how it's played out over the years to understand this question of how you can have such a, in some respects, head-snappingly significant change in doctrine at this late stage of our development from the Supreme Court. And in looking at the history of the Second Amendment, I, saw, I found uh, quite a few surprises. It turns out that the way we interpret this provision, in fact, the way we interpret all the provisions of the Constitution, owe considerably less to the pristine text and much more to the push and pull, to the rough and tumble of public advocacy, public argument, and political agitation throughout the country's whole history. So it turns out that the, you can learn a lot about the way our government was set up, the way our system was developed by looking at this history of the Second Amendment, even above and beyond the contentious and painful issue uh, of guns or violence. So the first surprise came to me when I went back and looked at what they were doing. Why is this in the, first, in the Constitution in the first place? In a way, the story starts in the hills outside Boston, 16 miles to the northwest at Lexington and Concord, when the first skirmishes of the American Revolution were fought by the Minutemen. That was the apogee of the well-regulated militia. The Minutemen were considered uh, the pride of the American concept of the militia. It turns out that that idea of the militia was really, rather than being sort of throat clearing, as we sometimes possibly think as we look at this confusingly written amendment, the militia w turned out to be very, very important to the founding generation. But it was also unlike anything we have now. What were those militias? Every man, every adult man, eventually every adult white man, was in the militia their entire adult life. And they were required by law to own a gun and to keep their military weapon at home and to bring it in for their militia service. That was the world they, they lived in. They thought this was really important. It was actually one of the more democratic institutions they had at the time. But not only that, they thought it was really important to ward off tyranny to ward off the specter of what they thought was the scariest thing they could imagine, which was the standing army. The same kind of army that King George had used in the United States, an army commanded by the king with paid soldiers. Instead, the militias were citizen soldiers who kept their guns at home, and they were going to block that kind of tyranny. And they thought that's what they were doing during the Revolutionary War. Now, as it, as it turns out, uh, the militias weren't so great at fighting and they had to actually rely on, increasingly, an army, commanded, of course, by George Washington. But they still were at the center of the philosophy, of the public and political philosophy of the founding generation. Well, you know uh, the broad outlines, of course, of what happened then. They won the revolution. The British sailed home. Pretty quickly, we began to develop into what we would call today a failed state. Uh, the Articles of Confederation were not working very well. You had mob violence 
and the inability of the governments of the time to do anything about it in Shays' Rebellion and elsewhere. So the leading men of the, of the states uh, went behind closed doors and crafted and drafted a constitution. It was emphatically designed by these young men, most of whom, many of whom had served with the Continental Army, designed to thrust toward a stronger central government. And when it was released, as you know, there was a roaring debate, one of the great debates in American history, over whether to ratify the Constitution. Many people were very fearful of this new government. They were afraid that, in fact, it would be tyrannical, that, in fact, it would, uh, it would uh, crush the states and crush the rights of the public. To move the Constitution through to ratification, there began to be a practice, basically, where it would get up to the edge of being defeated in the state, and then they would vote for ratification, uh, but they would say we should have some amendments as well. And dozens and dozens of proposed amendments from different states were forwarded as ideas for things to change in this new Constitution. This is where James Madison, of course, played a very important central role. Madison was a genius. He was a genius of Republican theory. He gives the ideals we follow in being in this building. But much more than that, he was a very canny political operator. And it was a, it was a treat to kind of watch him twist and turn and watch this dialogue between the politicians of the founding era and the public, who they thought were kind of roaring and yelling, but not necessarily with, with, uh, with so much clarity about what they wanted. Madison had helped craft the Constitution. He wrote the Virginia Plan that gave us the tripartite government we have. He organized, the, um, he organized the campaign to pass it. He co-authored anonymously the Federalist. He was against having amendments to the Constitution. We would say now he was against the Bill of Rights before he was for it. But he had to run for Congress in the very first congressional election. And they actually gerrymandered his district even before they came up with that word, uh, because uh, the only part of his district that was pro-Constitution was basically his house. And to win that election, to win over the dissident religious minority, the Baptists who were oppressed in that district by the Episcopalians and wanted a religious freedom amendment, he had to do the first great flip-flop in American political history and say, while it's true I've always been against amendments, that was then, uh, circumstances have changed, and now I'm for them. And I, that's what I meant all along. And it was a line used in various forms by tens of thousands of politicians after that. So Madison, having been a leading opponent of amendments, now had to go to Congress. He won by 339 votes. Now he was going to go to Congress and propose and pass amendments. Nobody was particularly interested. They all saw these amendments as kind of a, a what they called a tub to the whale, uh, a, which was uh, the metaphor they loved, which was if your boat was being chased by a whale, you would distract it by throwing a tub, a, a barrel in the water to distract it. It's like the way we would watch TV and the pundits would talk about throwing someone under the bus. They all saw this as a tub to the whale. Madison proposed eventually 20 amendments, ranging from the size of congressional districts to what the pay ought to be for members of Congress to the provisions that we now know as the Bill of Rights. The amendment dealing with the well-regulated militia was one of them. It drew very little notice. And uh, eventually it was, uh, it was proposed and it was marked up on the floor of the Congress and it was debated and it was passed. What did it mean? We don't fully know. We cannot actually know for sure, in part because there was so little discussion of the Second Amendment, what the, in contrast to other parts of the Constitution, what they meant. We do know this. There's not a, as we raise, these days engage in our intense debates over uh, gun rights and laws dealing with guns and, and what's appropriate and what, what, you know, what kind of gun laws we can have in the United States. And we sort of squint looking for that in the debate over the Second Amendment. What we find is something else. There is literally not a word in Madison's notes from the, con the Constitutional Convention, or with scattered exceptions in the records from the ratification conventions of the Constitution, or in the debate in the Congress 
on the Second Amendment, not a word about individual gun rights for self-protection or anything other than the militia. They were focused on the militias, and they were afraid that the central government would crush the militias. And in fact, Madison's proposal for the Second Amendment had a conscientious objector provision said if you have religious scruples about bearing arms, you don't have to do your military service in person, meaning you can get someone else, pay someone else to do it for you. And of the 12 people who spoke in the floor of the House of Representatives on the Second Amendment in the debate, it was all about the militia. So that was a real surprise, just how different a world they were living in. Now, again, these militias were not like any, they were not the same as the National Guard today. They were not the Army. Every adult white man was in the militia. And they had a gun. They were required to have a gun. But uh, I'm asked frequently, you know, writing a book like this on this controversial subject, so which was it? Was it, was it an individual right or was it the militias? The answer is it was both, and it was neither. They intended an individual right. They recognized an individual right for the purpose of fulfilling the duty to serve in the militia. Our question to the framers would make no sense, just in some ways like their answer to us makes no sense. Now, I want to be very clear. There were a lot of guns in America. People had guns. There were no police force. Uh, out on the frontier, people needed guns to deal with uh, Native American tribes or to deal with, uh, with hunting or any of these other things. Uh, they had an expectation that they had the right to have a gun uh, under especially common law handed down by courts from England. You had the right to self-defense. But at the same time, from the very beginning, there were also gun laws. At the time of the Constitution, there were laws that you could not keep a loaded gun in your home in Boston. Uh, there were cities where uh, you couldn't fire a gun within the city limits. There were all kinds of registries and registration and inspections of your guns by the government. And there were limits on who could own guns based on loyalty oaths and that sort of thing. Um, there were always guns, there were always gun rights, and there were gun laws. But what they thought they were doing in the Second Amendment was not really dealing with that stuff. They were dealing with the militia. Then something funny happened after that. Um, very quickly after the Second Amendment was ratified, the militia system that it revered, that it codified, that it enshrined, that militia system began to crumble. People stopped showing up for their militia duty. The country changed. We grew more individualistic. We moved out west. We cared more about making money. People just didn't think they were going to have to show up for these, these old-fashioned militias. The militias turned out not to work very well. People thought, Madison wrote in The Federalist, that uh, an, an armed citizenry could protect the country. and uh, You wouldn't need a, an army. Um, and uh, then the War of 1812 happened. And uh, the first of all, uh, the militias refused to participate. Uh, and the Maryland militia, 7,000 of them, were supposed to protect the capital. Uh, and the British kind of brushed right past them and burned down James Madison's house. And after that, we didn't think the militias were going to be the way we protected the country anymore. And the country changed. It grew. It developed. You had guns. You had gun laws all throughout that time. There's a, a wonderful photograph, even from the Wild West, uh, from Dodge City, the archetypal frontier town. It looks like a movie set. It's from the 1880s, and it looks like, you know, this dusty main street, and there's the saloons, and the hitching posts. It looks like Gary Cooper would walk down the street. And in the middle of the street is a sign, and it says, Welcome to Dodge City. Firearms prohibited. Dodge City. There were guns, and there were gun laws all the way through. And as I said, uh, there, there were twists and turns. Uh, after the Civil War, there was one of the purposes of the 14th Amendment was to make sure that the former slaves could get guns because they were being terrorized by white militias, the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, but all throughout, uh, the Supreme Court ruled that the Second Amendment was not recognizing an individual right to gun ownership. By, uh, that consensus was reflected by Warren Burger. Warren Burger, as some of you remember, was the Chief Justice of the United States rock-ribbed conservative appointed by Richard Nixon. In 1991, Berger said, the idea that the Second Amendment uh, protects an individual right to gun ownership, he said, is, quote, a fraud on the public. That was what they thought then. That was the consensus. It seems like a long time ago, doesn't it? Well, so what changed? That gets to the second surprise. 
What changed is the way we always get constitutional change in this country. There was a long-term focused campaign to change the way we saw the Constitution. And the key player was the National Rifle Association. Now the NRA, we all know the NRA now, that how powerful it can be at the ballot box. It's turned out to have had at least as significant a role in, in the constitutional law. The NRA's been around a long time. It was started after the Civil War by Union officers who thought that the men couldn't shoot very well. Uh, and it did training and marksmanship and, and military preparation. And then eventually, over time, uh, it spoke for the interests of hunters and sportsmen. Uh, it didn't oppose gun control laws necessarily. It actually testified for them. Uh, in the 1930s, when the first federal gun control law was proposed by the Roosevelt administration, the NRA testified for it. And when asked, is there any constitutional problem with it, uh, the NRA representative said, no, we can't think of any provision in the Constitution that this would run afoul of. Um, that was the NRA. It didn't love gun, gun laws, but it, but it was not uh, the way it is now. And it, what happened? What happened was the 1960s. We think of the 1960s, and we, of course, know that it was this time of great change and tumult. But in a lot of ways, the reaction to the 1960s that happened in the 1970s has lived with us much longer and has defined our era. In 1977, the NRA was going to move its headquarters from Washington, D.C. to Colorado to signal a retreat from politics. Uh, there was its annual meeting, which is still to this day called the Revolt at Cincinnati. Uh, a thousand activists came to the meeting, uh, voted out the old leadership, uh, voted in new leadership that was much more intense, much more ideological, I would argue much more dogmatic, and emphatically focused on recasting the organization around the idea of the Second Amendment, and that the Second Amendment protected an individual, untrammeled right to gun ownership. And uh, they turned the NRA, which describes itself now as the country's oldest civil rights organization, into a constitutional crusade. So that when you go out to Fairfax and you go to the lobby of the NRA headquarters, you walk in and there on the wall, in pride of place, is in big letters, is the Second Amendment. But you have to look carefully, because they've edited it. They actually edited out the part about the well-regulated militia. They have two dots. They don't even have three dots. They have two dots. Um, and so what did the NRA do? What did gun rights, more broadly, what did gun rights advocates, as they would style themselves, do? Well, they did what others have done throughout American history. They mounted a three-decade drive to change the way we saw this provision of the Constitution. They started with scholarship. There was a lot of scholarship, some of it good, about what the founding generation thought, what the English Bill of Rights meant, some of it not so good. In my book, I, I, go, through, uh, I go through the kind of plucking of quotes of founding fathers out of context that I liken to the people who write movie posters. Um, when you, uh, nowadays, we all have the ability to be originalists, to go back and look at the actual context of what people were saying. It often will turn out to be something very different from, from what uh, people mean. I'll give you an example. There was a quote from Thomas Jefferson that you'll see in law review articles everywhere, all kinds of scholarship. Uh, you can buy it on a t-shirt. It's on the NRA website today. It says, Thomas Jefferson, one, one loves to possess arms, the one hopes never to have to use them. Wow, you know, that's a good one, right? You actually go to the Library of Congress website and find out what he actually was saying. It was a letter to George Washington. He said, remember I sent you those letters from when I was Secretary of State? I think I'm going to get attacked for that decision I made. Could you send me back the letters? One loves to possess arms, though one hopes never to have to use them. It was a metaphor. For, he wanted actually some letters. Uh, but it's still quoted as proof of what the Second Amendment meant. Uh, and unfortunately, there's a bit too much of that. So there's scholarship, there's pseudo-scholarship. The uh, NRA and its allies moved to change public opinion so that by over the years, it emphatically became a widespread consensus view that the Second Amendment recognizes an individual right to gun ownership. That's the broad majorities of the public believe that. They, moved, they elected politicians, they moved the agencies of government so that, for example, the Justice Department switched its position in other parts of the government. And then, and only then, did gun rights advocates go to court. 
in, over the past decade leading to that 2008 Supreme Court decision. Only after they had won in the court of public opinion did they go to the court of law. So that when that 2008 decision happened, it basically fell like a ripe apple from the tree. It wasn't all that controversial. So that was the second surprise, was the constitutional central role of the NRA. What's the third surprise? What's happened then? What happened since that 2008 decision? And that's something that's also interesting. So that was the Heller decision. It recognized an individual right to gun ownership. Uh, I, I, in the book, I'm very critical of the decision. Um, out of the 64 pages of the um, majority opinion written by Justice Scalia, two deal with the militia, which was what the people back then thought they were dealing with, and the rest uh, looks at the words and it consults a lot of dictionaries and other things. I'm not a fan of the pretensions of uh, originalism that the opinion reflects, but it didn't say necessarily what people think it said. What the opinion said was, yes, there's an individual right to gun ownership, but as with all rights, there can be limits. As with all rights, there can be limits. How has it played out in the country? Well, in fact, in fact, Dozens and dozens of courts have heard cases since 2008 challenging gun laws, and overwhelmingly they've upheld those laws, saying yes, under this new doctrine, there's an individual right, but society too has a right to be protected. There's a compelling government interest in having strong gun safety laws. So with some limited exceptions, uh, gun laws have been upheld. And uh, for all the screaming and all the storming about uh, people's rights in the Second Amendment, it isn't really the case that much, uh, much of the Second Amendment stands in the way of much of the gun safety laws that are being discussed now. Last year, when there was a great debate after Newtown over uh, legislation in Congress, and you had the Manchin-Toomey bill, which was the bipartisan bill to strengthen uh, background checks, that was not defeated by Second Amendment arguments. It was defeated by the filibuster. It actually had a majority of the votes, but people, and the argument against it was it was too much paperwork, it didn't work, but not really that it, blocked, it was blocked by the Second Amendment, because everybody recognizes that government can, can make sure the wrong people don't have guns. That uh, suggests, perhaps, now that, that's, the Supreme Court hasn't spoken again. Uh, there is what we lawyers call a circuit split developing, where. Uh, the court in California, the federal court in California, has struck down the gun carrying laws of California. The question now is, about, does Heller re related to having a gun in your home, a handgun in your home, what about carrying a gun outside your home? Uh, th that case is going to get heard probably by a much wider group of judges. It may well be that that goes up to the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court has strikingly turned down opportunity after opportunity to rule on this stuff again. And all of that suggests that maybe there's actually some common ground that can be found uh, in, in the way we address guns, despite the heat and the intensity of this debate. I was, uh, we have of course nearly, we're not, nobody, even if anybody wanted to, nobody is going to seize and take away everybody's guns. We have nearly 300 million guns in the United States. It's interesting, the number of gun owners, it, we have more guns than before, but the rate of gun ownership is going down. The ranks of gun ownership is shrinking, even as we have more and more guns. Uh, and the uh, challenge on this issue is how can we find a way within this constitutional framework to make progress. I was very struck just a couple of weeks ago, there was a new statistic that I just heard, which is that this year, for the first time, more people will be killed in the United States by cars than by guns. 30,000 people. Now, at one level, of course, that's a horrifying statistic. Most, most of that, a lot of that is suicide and other things like that, but still, it's a lot of people. And, it's, and no other developed country comes anywhere close to having that rate of firearms-related death. But what's really interesting is not that number. It's about the cars. Cars used to kill a lot more people. What happened? They didn't confiscate the cars. They didn't take away your right to drive or to travel, they made the cars safer. 
They made the cars safer. They put in airbags. They changed the drinking age. They changed the speed limit. They put in seat belts. All the technological fixes that we know have made cars much safer. There are things like that. There are things like that that can make guns much harder to use in the wrong hands. I don't think that the current version of the Second Amendment blocks that in any meaningful way. What I worry about is the degree of constitutional fundamentalism, of Second Amendment fundamentalism, that risks making it harder and harder to do that kind of common sense effort. Uh, I was very struck. Uh, I was very struck by the recent shootings and the, the debate that happened afterwards. You know, within a few days, within a few hours, the father of one of the victims out in California had the presence of mind to give a press conference, Richard Martinez, in which he said of his son Christopher, he said, you talk about gun rights, well, what about my son Christopher's right to live? And then there was a response a few days later from Joseph Wurzelbacher, Joe the plumber from the 2008 election, who said, I'm, and this is an actual quote, I'm sorry for your dead kids, but uh, that you're, I'm sorry, but your dead kids don't tramp, can't trample on my constitutional rights. That binary approach, that idea that somehow there is a pure and pristine text that says that we can't have common sense laws in the United States is actually at odds with the whole history of the country. It's not how you got the Second Amendment. It's not how we came to interpret the Second Amendment. And I'm certainly hoping that as we discuss and debate these issues, we understand that what the Second Amendment means, as with the whole Constitution, it's not up to James Madison. He's not going to tell us. It's not up to the Supreme Court. It's actually up to all of us all the time. That's the way it's always been, and it will be that way going forward. So thank you for your attention. I'm very happy to answer any questions or, or have any conversation. And, and you, all, you all are taping this, so I should probably repeat the question. Yes, thank you very much. Go ahead, sir. Uh, about six months ago, or a couple of months ago, there was a shooting somewhere where the shooter was reloading his suit, his face knocking down. Uh, and a year ago, of course, a shooter went into the school room and shot all his children and some of the adults with a machine gun in effect. Now, the shooting that only had the, that required the person to reload is, a, is I guess, a single shot at weapon. But the difference between a single shot and the other kind of weapon is a machine gun. Right. Now, the laws have always been against machine guns in the public domain. So why doesn't this argument substance over form, whole, why don't they say that if the guns can be turned into machine guns by simply switching something on a gun, then it's a machine gun, and it can't be sold in the public. Why is that a good approach to dealing with this business of these, these automatic weapons? So it's an excellent question, and I'll re try to summarize it and repeat it, which is that when, uh, when someone has a single shot weapon, it's possible, or a, a weapon that can't fire so many rounds, it's possible for somebody to stop them, easier for somebody to stop them from shooting. But if there's a weapon that can be turned into a machine gun or has many rounds, uh, it, it, in fact, that's much harder. And is, haven't we always banned machine guns? And isn't that a, an answer to this? Uh, so first of all, Justice uh, Scalia, in his opinion, talked about some obvious examples, and I believe machine guns were one of them. Uh, in the wake of these mass shootings, there were proposals to restore the uh, ban on assault weapons, on multiple round weapons uh, under federal law. And in fact, a couple of states, Colorado and New York among them, uh, and Connecticut also passed, uh, passed laws tightening or banning these kinds of things. Um, it's an interesting and not entirely settled constitutional question because uh, f folks who believe that there is an unlimited right to gun ownership under the Second Amendment would say that w while maybe you could do a background check to make sure that a convicted uh, criminal can't, uh, can't get a gun, this is the kind of uh, weapon that cannot, in fact, be banned or cannot, in fact, be regulated. That's what they would argue. Um, courts so far have upheld those kinds of rulings uh, because those are unusually dangerous weapons. And this is where one of the complications of the Supreme Court 
thrusting itself, as I would argue, into this debate. We've always fought these issues out in the ballot box in the legislature. In fact, these kind of um, this is an issue where the kinds of uh, compromises are, I believe, are much better made in the democratically accountable branches. When it comes to assault weapons, uh, as with all these weapons, uh, the the Supreme Court said that you could ban guns that were unusually dangerous and not in common use. Well, there, as I said, there are almost 300 million guns in the United States. There are about 3 million assault weapons. So is 3 million unusual, or is that 3 million? It's a lot of guns. It strikes me as bizarre to think that we need to go back and look either at colonial history to find some analogous weapon or at market share to decide if we have the ability to stop a particularly dangerous uh, dangerous product. If it was a toaster, we could regulate it. Um, so I think you've asked a, a good set of questions. Yes? Um, I just happened to glance at your book um, for just a second and noticed that you referred, and I didn't realize what you said, about um, this Judge Posner in Illinois, who is both a staunch conservative but basically gave a scathing to this way out of this self-proclaimed originalism. Yet at the same time, um, supported um, a decision for um, the rights of individuals. Do you want to just comment on that? Concept? Sure. The, the, the question was about Judge Posner, and it's, a, it's an interesting uh, side story. Um, Judge Posner, you're right, is one of the most esteemed judges and law professors and thinkers in the United States. He's a very leading conservative uh, and uh, was harshly, harshly critical of the Heller decision. He and a number of other leading conservatives and conservative judges said that they thought the Heller decision was just the kind of judicial overreach loosey-goosey constitutionalism that they felt they'd been arguing against when liberals were doing it. Um, and uh, Posner, Judge Posner criticized the opinion in a variety of forums, in books and in blogs, uh, and, and Justice Scalia wound up responding and called him a liar, and it, was, it actually got very personal, and, and uh, it was a very good thing they didn't have guns, you know. Um, but then, uh, then one of these constitutional questions came to Ju Judge Posner, who was a judge on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, Federal Court of Appeals in Chicago. And Posner had said it doesn't make any sense, for example, for a crowded city to have to have the same gun laws as Montana, where it's much more spread out and it's all very different. Well, he, had, he felt he had no choice, but nonetheless, he criticized Heller in his opinion, but felt he had nonetheless uh, no choice but to apply it. And in fact, I thought he went further than he had to. He struck down the state of Illinois' gun law. So that Illinois had the strictest law prohibiting the carrying of concealed or open weapons. And he struck it down uh, in a case called Moore versus Madigan. It gave the legislature 180 days to pass a new law. But uh, the law that they passed was much looser, much more liberal, uh, in, in the classic sense, much less restrictive than uh, it had been. And now when you, one, it is a striking thing when you go into the towering uh, downtown of the city of Chicago, you walk in and this is something that was put in the law as a protection for people who didn't want guns in their place of business. It, you, if you don't want people carrying guns into your store or your place of business, you can do that, but you have to put a decal on the front of your store with a gun on it, with a line through it. So everywhere you walk in Chicago now that you see these decals, and it's, it's, it's certainly a change, and a lot of people find it unnerving at the very least. Yes, sir, and then you, ma'am. You mentioned it uh, briefly. Uh, there's, there's two folds to this issue, and the one is the access to weapons. But the other is the volume that's already out there. Right. How do you deal with that part of it? You know, I, you know and guns, of course, last for a long time. And so when you have 300 million guns or nearly 300 million in this country, that's a reality irrespective of what people think should or should not be the policy. Um, so uh, that, that creates as much of a reality as the Second Amendment. Um, and so, uh, you know, both for constitutional reasons and for political reasons and all other kinds of reasons, I think that, that uh, gun laws that would envision seizing guns you know, are not going to happen. But it turns out, too, that the kinds of laws that can have the greatest impact on violence don't 
have to be that draconian or they have to be that intrusive. Of course, one of the other broad trends we know is gun violence is going down, as with all crime. Now, nobody's entirely sure why crime has gone down as much as it has in the United States, but, but it has, and gun crime along with it. And it does seem that a lot of the things that make a difference are things like policing tactics, the numbers of police on the street, that kind of thing, rather than a gun law. So it may be, again, that uh, gun laws that would touch on the Second Amendment are not even necessarily the ones that have the greatest impact on the threat from gun violence. Yes, ma'am. It's a, it's a great question. The question is, is, uh, is there arms industry money behind the, the gun rights movement and the NRA? And I get asked this question a lot. Um, as I understand it, and I only know this from reading journalism and that sort of thing, less than you would think, in the sense that the NRA gets its power from the intensity of its members. It's not, it's a big organization. It's got about three million people, I believe. Uh, but a AARP has 30 million. Um, it's more the intensity and the fact that they, they will vote on a single issue. In the past decade and a half, gun manufacturers have begun to provide financial support for the NRA. That was partly because they were, they were um, making deals with, and, and uh, making agreements with the Clinton administration and others for trigger locks and other things to make guns safer, and they faced boycotts from gun owners. Uh, and in response to that, Business Week has written about this quite a bit. In response to that, they pulled out of the deals and started funding the NRA. So it may be that the uh, it may be that there's a change in all of that. And I do think there's, to a significant degree, a change in the nature of the of of the gun rights movement. And I don't entirely know how it's going to play out. As I mentioned, for a long time, uh, the NRA spoke for hunters. When I was working for President Bill Clinton and he fought for uh, the Brady Bill, which was the, the waiting period and then eventually the um, background check, and the assault weapons ban in 1994. Um, you know, he, he used to brag that, well, I'm from Arkansas, half the people in the state of Arkansas have a hunting license, uh, and not a single hunter has had their gun taken away uh, by, by any of these laws. And that was, that was true. We thought there was a silent majority of, of gun owners at the very least, or even NRA members who weren't as fired up about this stuff. I'm not entirely sure that uh, when one thinks of the NRA, when one goes to its meetings, hears the speeches by Wayne LaPierre and others, or reads its website, there's not a lot about hunting. It's much more of an insurrectionist tone and a fear of government uh, and uh, a fear of the chaos, the, the civilizational breakdown all around us that they see, and that only an armed individual, uh, a, a, a super, a super uh, you know, an enhanced individual through through possession of arms is the way to fight off uh, those forces. And I'm not entirely sure that you know appealing to hunters is is or even the gun industry is, can get around that. I think it's I don't entirely know what the answer is uh, as a political matter, but it's it's a change. It does strike me as a considerable change from from what used to be. Yes. Has Scalia written most of the five to four opinions? Well, that's a good question. Is what, what about Justice Scalia and his role? So th as we know right now in the Roberts Court, the Supreme Court led by Justice John Roberts, uh, it is, there are a lot of very significant five to four rulings. Um, and some of us believe that they have been a form of judicial activism, of striking down laws, of, um, of reaching beyond where the court needed to go. The very first one of those big five to four rulings was the Heller case written by Scalia, and then it was followed by Citizens United uh, and by the, the law last year. The, they came within one vote of striking down the health care law on the grounds of the Commerce Clause, which would have struck down and affect hundreds of other statutes. They didn't do it, but there were five votes for that. And then last year's vote on uh, gutting uh, the Voting Rights Act. These are seen as the examples of activism by this court. Of those, only one of them, only the Heller case, was written by Justice Scalia. Um, he, he is a, he's a brilliant man. He has been very, very influential in his advocacy of originalism. But until recently, at least, 
he was so strong in his views that he drove away other justices, and basically he didn't write the majority opinions. They wouldn't, Ch Justice Rehnquist, would, Chief Justice Rehnquist would not assign them to him for fear, perhaps, of driving away other justices. So Heller was actually the biggest case he ever wrote, and it was after two decades or more on the bench. So it's not really that Scalia's name is on the opinions, but in a lot of ways his voice is what is in the courtroom because there's so much focus now on original intent. There's so much of an effort to try to figure out what the framers meant. There's a case that you all might not have heard of that's going to be, unless it was decided this morning, I don't think it was, it's going to be decided, announced in the next week called Noel Canning. And what it deals with is the recess appointments and what the power of a president is to make recess appointments. And there's language in the Constitution which again was from a time when you had to ride a horse to get to Washington you know, over a long period of time. There's a long practice that's grown up since then of how we actually do it so that the country kind of functions, so the government functions. And the question in front of the court is, well, okay, th we know this is how we've done it for several de centuries, but it said this here, and this is what they meant at the time. So which one do we look at, the, the two centuries or what they meant back then? And I think there's a very good chance the court will, will considerably restrict any president, certainly this president's ability to make recess appointments using an originalist analysis. So Scalia is very influential even if he doesn't get to write the big, the big opinions. Yes, ma'am. Great question. So the question is about the tests used by courts, by these federal courts, as they look at um, at these laws. So, as with most constitutional rights, as I said, there are rights and there are limitations on the rights. Well, how do courts figure out what kind of law violates those rights? Generally speaking, and this is certainly how uh, the First Amendment is treated, for example, they ask, well, is this right? touched on at all by this law? Is the Second Amendment right even affected? And if it is affected, then what standard of review do we judges use to see if a law falls afoul of this right? Um, it's not uh, it, it, what's called rational basis, which is the loosest standard, where basically if a legislature or you know, a government agency can make can make any kind of argument at all that what they're doing is necessary, then that counts. But it's not what's called strict scrutiny either. Strict scrutiny is the tightest uh, standard that, that we use for a lot of First Amendment protect, protected activity, which is that you have to show that it's uh, uh, there's a compelling government interest and that it's the narrowest possible basis um, and the only way to go and, and, and a bunch of other things. It's basically a kind of intermediate level of scrutiny where they say, well, it, there has to be a strong government interest and they have to show that they have a strong interest. And if they can show that, then it still is upheld. So the question is, will the Supreme Court, when these cases get back up to the Supreme Court, will they go for that or not? The Supreme Court was very vague about what kind of test they thought ought to be applied. This is pretty universally what states have done. Uh, what I'm sorry, what judges have done. There was a significant and uh, meaningful, I would argue, dissent in a case here in the District of Columbia that suggests otherwise. Brett Kavanaugh is a judge on the District of Columbia Circuit Court of Appeals. He is a leading conservative judge. Many people believe that he W might be nominated to the Supreme Court someday if a Republican wins the presidency. He, uh, of great interest to me, was the principal author of the Star Report, though he, he swears that he didn't write the, the smutty stuff. Um, but, but anyway, he's a big deal in, in the conservative legal world, and he dissented in a case and said, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh this is not how you do it. You have to look at history. You have to go back and say, was there a regulation back then that was like this regulation? And if there was, then that's okay. But if not, you can't just apply an intermediate scrutiny test uh, that's not what the Supreme Court meant. So who knows? Uh, we'll find that out the next time they take a case. Again, they keep declining the opportunity to take these cases. Some people think that if nothing else, look, at one level it's good. You want, the, you want there to be a consensus that develops. That's 
the way, whoops, that's the way they teach us in law school how it's supposed to go. Other people think that uh, the four liberals and the four conservatives aren't sure where Justice Kennedy is, and so rather than finding out and being unpleasantly surprised, they kick the can down the road a little. So we'll see. Yes, ma'am. Well, again, so the question is, uh, in, in the public debate, uh, where I, I, I argued that this is a, a, an issue where the decisions are by far best made, if at all possible, not in a courtroom, but in a uh, legislature, in the, public, uh, in the public soapbox, and in the general democratically accountable way we do things. And as you said, well, the, the, the voice of the minority here can sometimes drown out uh, everybody else. There's no, solu there's no solution in my mind other than for people who have a different view to organize and argue just as effectively as the NRA has. Um, you know, on that Manchin-Toomey bill that I mentioned, the background checks, all the public opinion polls showed that there was n up to 90% of the public supported the Manchin-Toomey bill. But it wasn't, honestly, it wasn't the Second Amendment that blocked it. It wasn't even really the power of the NRA. It was the filibuster rule. The fact that we take for granted that you need 60 votes to do anything in the United States Senate, which is you can look all over the, this whole building for the place in the Constitution where it says that, and it doesn't say that. In fact, they were very worried. The framers were very worried about supermajority requirements. So, you know, I, I, it's a conundrum because, of course, it's the classic political scientist's dilemma of a, of, of a narrow interest with a more intense view sometimes can trump the wider consensus of less passionately held views. I don't think that the answer is more single interest groups. I don't think the American democracy, what it really needs is more, more single issue voters and single issue contributors. Um, but I do go back in the most broad sense uh, to the question of how we make constitutional change. It's always been public debate. It takes years. It takes constant, persistent public argument. And I am very fond of a quote from Abraham Lincoln from the great constitutional debate over slavery and abolition. In the eight, first Lincoln-Douglas debate, he said, with public opinion, everything is possible. Without public opinion, nothing is possible. He who molds public sentiment has greater power than a judge or a legislator because it makes, they make it possible for those judge or legislators to rule. That's the story of this issue. It was the story of slavery. It's the story of how we got civil rights laws. It's the story of how we have marriage equality moving through the courts, and people see that in the Constitution. That's always the way we make constitutional change in this country, and this is going to be no exception. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Michael, for your eloquent explanation of not only the book, but a good chunk of American history. Uh, it's You've really uh, not only set up a number of questions for the future, but you've provided a framework for an answer that we appreciate very much. We're going to have a book signing in the back. Please buy the book. And I also want to thank Michael publicly for reminding me that we are in the James Madison building. And as you go out, uh, if you go out the first street entrance, please take a look, maybe walk in Madison Hall and look at some of those wonderful quotations about the Constitution and liberty and learning leaning on each other that have come from James Madison. One more round of applause, and please join us for the book signing. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.